大家好，我是财经世界说驻欧洲的记者宁慧。我今天在中欧国家斯洛文尼亚，在当代最活跃的公共知识分子，被称作西方最危险的哲学家希泽克的家里。接下来一个多小时时间里，我会跟试着跟希泽克聊会天，聊天的内容将会包括雾霾啊、难民、消费主义啊、当下的欧洲的意识形态、特朗普、暴力等等看起来天马行空的话题。但我相信他的观点会让你觉得耳目一新。Thanks, Mr. Jerry, to take the time with us. Let's、uh, start by. I'm very about... glad and proud to be with you.、Here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Let's start by talking about artificial intelligence, since these movies and books have threatened us for too long that human will no longer be on the top of the food chain. There's a recent case: a Google-developed computer program, AlphaGo, secretly beating up the world top human players online. Go is considered traditionally quite difficult, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, ball game for、uh, AI to master. It's a sign for AI to soon outsmart human. A very related discussion is the immortality, the idea that、um, genetic engineering, med, you know, regenerative medicine, nanotechnology will speed up the evolution of human race, but just for the very few people. So the idea is that future will not be in the hands of human as we know, but in the hands of a thinking machine or a mutant human race, an elite.、Um, do, do, how, what is your take on that? Do you think that's really going going to happen? I think that although often. Researchers, not real researchers, but popularizers of、yeah. artificial intelligence, exaggerate. But I think that something extremely important is happening here. Incidentally, in Europe, the same thing happened over a decade ago. Maybe some of our listeners remember this. You know, when a computer beat in chess,、yeah. Garry Kasparov,、yeah. it was over. Chess is now no longer as popular as that. For example. Thirty years ago, forty, when I was younger, I、yeah. remember, in our newspapers, the sports section says、uh, sports and chess. It was regularly reported and so on. Now chess is out. So we reject a、yeah. game that AI could master. Yeah. But yeah. Why is that? Yeah, because、sense? it it you are somehow aware that you are playing a second violin. That, ah, that, you interesting. Know, that machine. But, but, but then, if machine beats us on everything, would us then become a inferior class? This is a big question. You know、Are、which problems I see. If I may a little bit go a little bit more into th- theoretical water.、Yeah. First, you said very well for some people who will become immortal. So my fear is、uh, not simply we humans will become immortal, or some will, some will not.、Yeah. It will affect all of us. But what I fear is that it will affect, in a different way, different classes. The rich one、yeah. will build themselves into super being, privileged.、Yeah. Why? They will also begin to genetically modify ordinary people、ah. to be ideal workers and、ah. so on. <laughs> I think that's the thing. You know, is that、uh, some people will control, the other will be controlled. That's、and it's already happening. It's very, you know, what I especially fear. And with my connections, I know some people who know people who、yeah. work for these mysterious government、uh, defense、yeah. agencies.、Uh, even military strategy is moving in that direction. It's no longer just、uh, just atomic bombs and chemical weapons.、Yeah. It's different ways to manipulate this. But okay, let's go. Sorry, let's go to basic problems. The problems I see are this one. I think that even philosophically,、mm-hmm. by philosophically I mean at the basic level, what is happening with the human being today? This is a profound change. You know, at what level? What is the very base of our sense of individual responsibility and freedom? That you are free in your thoughts.、Yeah. My thoughts are here. Reality is out there. You can beat me, you can torture me, whatever, but you cannot control what I think.、Uh, Humanity is here. Yeah, yeah. Not there. Yeah, it's not only here, but this is the last point of resistance. Yeah. But what we know is happening now is that this gap that separates inside from outside、mm-hmm. is slowly disappearing.、Yeah. Uh, <coughs> sorry. For example, I. I、uh, I have some friends who are doing this、uh, brain science research,、mm-hmm. and they told me, you know, to what extent they can already 
directly connect our brains, yeah. what we think, yeah. to external machines. For example, you know uh, Stephen Hawking, yeah, yeah. crippled. Yeah. 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 He no longer even has to move his finger. Yeah. They yeah. already can connect with some electrodes to a computer his brain, yeah. and he just has to think strongly forward, yeah. and his wheelchair moves forward. So it is happening. It is happening, but you know what's the danger? Now, this sounds wonderful. We are becoming like gods. Yeah. I think about something, it happens in reality. Usually we think only God can do things. Yeah, yeah. He thinks it happens. But you know, what goes out goes in. Mm. This means that only in the other direction you can also do it. Yeah. That you can. Do, and I was told that it's. They don't even want to make it public, but it's tremendous progress here. Yeah, For yeah. example, a, a, a friend of mine, a neuronal biologist, yeah. showed me some terrifying movies. You know that they already can do this with a rat. They connect her neurons which control movement, yeah. and then the rat runs around in a big cage. Mm. Then you press a button and the, the cat is attached to your remote controller mm. and the cat becomes like a remote control toy car. Oh, really? Uh, you direct it and it runs. Uh, that. And yeah. now comes the big question. They don't want to make it public. They're very discreet. The big problem for them is this one. Let's imagine that we do this to a human yeah. being. I am here in this apartment. I walk around freely and then all of a sudden Somebody presses that the button, button and can direct me. Yeah. How will I experience it? Will I experience it as if, oh my God, I'm no longer myself? Would you want to experiment? Would you want to be the subject? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because this be would have curious. interested me. Yeah. And they told me discreetly that they, they already did this experiment oh, okay. and that the result is very sad. Okay. You know what is the result? No? You don't know that you are controlled. Yeah. You still think that you are freely wandering around and so on. So this development of okay. the, when the distinction between inside and outside. Yeah. Also, with all this genetic intervention and, and uh, uh, pharmaco means, pills yeah. and so on, which control your, your mental images. Are we aware that all our usual pedagogy is becoming obsolete? Let's say you are a good girl, mm -hmm. good in the sense of uh, diligent, hardworking, and I am lazy. Yeah. And we compete for a job, some difficult examination. You work crazy day and night. Yeah. What if I, uh, with, through some chemical means, enhance my abilities just and it. just somehow yeah. do it in a, some, uh, I don't know, you already can get some lessons through sleep. I was told while you sleep, you are, and then I win over you without yeah. any effort. Are we aware what this means? All our pedagogy, yeah. even ethics, like what if, mind. for example, let's say you are not ethical. They are already developing pills will sharpen your ethical. So, oh, you know no. what they already have? I love this. They already have religious pills. The really? idea is that they located where your religious experience happens, and then uh, no, you don't believe in God, no problem. You know, you know, like, no, and, and this is still not yet developed. Know, but basically, we are already approaching this. So I am neither a pessimist here. I'm not saying this is the end of humanity. Yeah. I'm also not crazy. Op like Ray Kurzweil, but I'm saying something tremendous new is happening yeah. and we have to openly confront it. Yeah. We are That's avoiding this problem. Either they both are idiots, this futurologist optimist yeah. or uh, singularity, new collective consciousness, yeah. but are, are they aware that if this singularity will happen, we will lose our individuality with this, we will lose our critical that's, thinking and so on. Yeah, that, that, that's really... So it's a mega problem. I know, that, that's why I want to start with a mega problem yeah. in the future and drag us probably... This is something that shouldn't be left neither to big corporations, capital, nor to state. This What's should be... The, the only rule here is, this is why I support Julian Assange, Wikileaks, yeah. We have to be open public about yeah, it. Yeah. We have to debate. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bring up the next subject, yeah. which I think is related somehow, which yeah. is the, the a new um, emerging uh, economic class in China, the middle middle class yeah. in China, 
which uh, uh, a lot have been said about them. There are a lot of them. People disagree whether it's 150 million yes. or 200 million. Some people that's even claim 300 million. Yeah, million, but yeah, yeah, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I want to point out one aspect of emerging yeah. class, which is their, they play this role of furious um, consumers with very serious trust issues, especially on food, baby product, or anything affect their body. So they really mistrust, mistrust this kind of product. And then instead, they turn to Western brands for safety. So that milk, uh, milk powder for infants has to I be know, from Netherlands. New Zealand or yeah, New yeah, Zealand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, but do you think, how, how does that work? They don't think this is a lifestyle issue. They think this is a very basic security issue. But is it really the case? Can we yeah, really first, I cannot brand? judge about, all I can tell you is that, uh, uh, now, I don't have a deep philosophical yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah. Just maybe two things that may interest your public. Yeah. First, you know, up to a point, I wouldn't make fun of them, mock them. I yeah. understand them yeah. because you did have some big problems with milk yeah, powder yeah, and exactly. so on. There was a big scandal a couple of years ago when they discovered that the big Western, especially milk, chocolate product, even wash powder, mm -hmm. it, it, it was Nestle, whatever, Persil, the big brand. Yeah they discovered that they are making a special lower quality yeah. for product for our uh, market yeah. the and they were standard. not cheaper, they were even more expensive. Yeah. So I yeah. would say uh, don't trust Western companies yeah. here. Yeah. They are very manipulative but, here. But do you think that when people are buying for safety, they are not buying for lifestyle? Or they are also. But also, they also uh, I wrote a lot about it. Uh, Although I understand this panic when you have mass poisoning and so on, yeah. but safety and especially uh, ecological awareness yeah. is, this is my old thesis, is to a large extent more a matter of ideology, lifestyle, than a matter of real quality. Yeah. Why do people, this is my very good example, why do people like to buy organic apples? I doubt if they are really so much better. It makes you feel Maybe good. better, yeah. Maybe. But it makes you feel good, yeah. you know. Oh my God, I'm doing something for Mother Nature. Yeah. I'm, I'm part of a big unity of humanity. I'm yeah. doing something. Another field of this ideology is this false, false support of charity. Yeah. We live our rich lives and we think that exactly. if we give one percent to charity we are doing something that's why uh, something great that's why i read i wrote i don't know if you have them in china mm -hmm. uh, you have in china everywhere i saw them those uh, seven up or what those stores seven. yeah yeah seven up yeah, but yeah. you don't do you already have a, a, in china starbucks yes Yes, but I, I don't know how they work in China, but in the West, they are full of this false charitable activity. You know, they tell you our cappuccino is a little bit more expensive, but 1% goes for Guatemala children, the other 1% goes to... And, and I think it's all ideology. Yeah, yeah. They, and they want you... What you buy there, it's a wonderful ultimate form of capitalism yeah. where you don't just buy... You are not just a consumer in the sense of buying a product. You also buy your ecological and humanitarian clear yeah. conscience. Yeah. You know, yeah. you pay more. Like it, that's what I found. That your ecological awareness, your humanitarian attitude, also become a commodity that you buy. Exactly. Exactly. You you pay a little bit more for cappuccino. You can say, you see, I'm a good humanitarian. I help the yeah. underdeveloped, yeah. and so on and so on. And so, in China, uh, it's also food safety, and there's one more thing, air. So there's, you know, something as basic uh, as uh, food, but for Chinese, it may be difficult to buy from a foreign brand. I want to um, please, ask yes. on that, because um, the, the, the discussion on air pollution has been heated for years, and I think people slowly come to realization that it won't just simply, quickly go away. And a very popular opinion nowadays is yes. that consumerism is to be blamed. The middle class who live in a city in China should buy less, waste less, and not live like their American peer, big houses and several cars. Well, part of the reason is that the capital and the states yeah. shouldn't sacrifice economic development. That would have been me, us, the middle class, yeah. leave the poor, remain poor, and not letting China... Yeah, but I have here another, a couple of points to say. The yeah, first yeah. one is, you know, uh, like... Uh, but why should then Americans be allowed to consume and you don't? Yeah. I mean, this is again a, an argument for communism. We have to, not to say, like, China is always accused of polluting and so on and so on, but no, the United States are still polluting more. So, first, let's not blame some countries and so on. Uh, uh, 
second thing, uh, I think that the result is this one. Okay, you should use market as far as it works. Mm -hmm. And it does work up to a point. Yeah. If uh, certain products pollute more the environment, you tax them more, etc., and so on. That's okay. But uh, nonetheless, I think the clear thing here is that neither the market nor the state yeah. can do it alone. I, uh, I think, again, awakened public. People should be told the truth. Mm -hmm. These are the consequences, what to do. What do you suggest them to do? I mean, besides buying air cleaner, every person in Beijing buys air cleaner. They go out wearing masks, but they, they wonder what else can, can they do, right? In that case. Yeah, on the, on the one hand, I, yeah, no, something. I think that nonetheless, this don't fall into this game, which mm -hmm. is a typical capitalist game mm -hmm. of blaming poor ordinary people. People have the right to live in, with certain consumerism and so on and yeah. so on. Here, simply, the only thing that can save us, I think, is a collaboration of state regulation, but not state apart from public opinion, state and the awakened public opinion. Yeah. And they should impose regulations. This is the problem of our commons. We all are breeding care and so on. Yeah. And this is another limit of capital. One limit is, we already uh, mentioned it, uh, yeah. one limit is biogenetics and so on. Tremendous things are happening. People should be aware what is happening and so on. It concerns us all. The other problem is, again, Ecology. I don't think that the state alone, in some dark way, will be able to regulate it. Markets have to be controlled, limited, but people, ordinary people, should be made uh, subjects. I, I think in China, for example, the big problem of China, from what I know, was that Three Gorges Dam, you know. Yeah. And I don't know what is the state of things now, how many problems, but when you engage in projects like that, you should have a big public debate. Yeah. That's the only solution. This yeah. is my only trust, although I'm otherwise very skeptical about democracy. Yeah. I don't, I, I'm not saying that democracy always works. Yeah. Look in Europe now. <laughs> if you were to have pure democracy, yeah. it would be racism. Yeah. Refugees would, but with ecology, democracy works. I, I want to talk about the, uh, the concept of agents by bringing the concept of catastrophe. Um, you know, you talk yeah. about uh, air pollution, but then it's so heavy, but it's soon normalized. But then That's people the big do horror talk about the idea of very severe future disaster, like a, a catastrophe. But you know what, uh, this is the strength of ideology in everyday life. Yeah. That uh, one way not to confront a catastrophe mm -hmm. is to talk all the time about it, but in the way we are talking it, not really taking it seriously. Yeah. And because then, on the one hand, you paint it as a catastrophe, yeah. But when it happens, you are ready immediately to renormalize it. Yeah. I agree with you, this concept of renormalization is crucial, and I know it from my past. For example, you know, in Yugo ex Yugoslavia, we had the terrible civil war in the early 90s, and I had many friends in Sarajevo, capital and Bosnia. Yeah. They knew the war is coming. Yeah. But up to a point, they just thought it cannot really happen. We are in the middle of Europe. Uh, 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 late 20th century, we cannot have, like in medieval times, a big city under sea. It happened, but the moment it happened, it was, as you said, it was instantly renormalized. And now it's horrible to read how globally, I'm not talking about China, yeah. the ecological crisis is renormalized. Yeah. For example, now it's a catastrophe how Greenland, Greenland is yeah. getting warm. Yeah. But you know what I read a couple of weeks ago? How it's wonderful they're growing vegetables there already. Without but, seeing the rest of the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's uh, this renormalization, and what I fear if I jump to another level is how with Trump's presidency the same thing will yeah. happen. First, liberals were totally shocked. Trump, Hitler in power, the end. And now, slowly, it will get unfortunately, renormalized. Yeah, I'm let's afraid. finish this catastrophe because I want to bring yeah. up Trump right after this. Mm. Uh, I wonder if you would agree that cat catastrophe provided a illusion and we will face it together as equals. But in Absolutely. Th this that, is, you know, where, I, no? But at the same time, it's uh, our way 
to imagine the end of the world, because this is a big enigma. I haven't yet found a good theory of it. Why so many Hollywood blockbusters now are about catastrophe, yeah, right. post-catastrophic world? And I think here we almost have some kind of Hollywood Marxism. I mean, they predict all a future society mm -hmm. with strict class divisions. There are those who are in, there are those... It's a, you know, films like, I don't know, like, like, uh, uh, like Elysium, like Hunger Games. This year, a class society which is much stronger than the traditional capitalist class society. Yeah. Because in traditional class society, we are still member of the same people with same political rights. Just some of us are more rich than others. But here we have literally two different classes. I think that in future, if we will not have some version of communism. Class distinction will become connected with biogenetics. Yeah. Also, almost a race distinction. The ruling class will be better genetically equipped, will be literally a different race. We will be already prepared after all these uh, horror movies, maybe when that scenario comes. Yeah, this know. is why, although some people think these Hollywood movies are progressive, yeah. warning. No, I think they are very ambiguous, because yeah. in the way they paint this future, again, they lay the ground for it, but I deeply agree with your point, how uh, uh, and it's not only uh, uh, it's not only this type of catastrophe, but you know, all these mega movies, like Independence Day, yeah. where worse is under threat but they are really about solidarity, yeah. because the message is, but when there will be this type of real danger, we will all become solidary. The Arabs, Jews... Independence Day is Americans' leader. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but for anyway. example, don't forget that in uh, 2012, yeah. you Chinese built the ships. You know, those oh, gigantic yeah, yeah, ships. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, of course you have all those three yeah. that you mentioned. Right. That, but that, but what I'm saying yeah. is that my good friend, American Marxist Frederick Jameson, always emphasized this, how Catastrophe films are bring a message of solidarity, but a very sad message. Yeah. It, the only way in our society is to produce solidarity is through a total catastrophe. No, we are just talking about the catastrophe. I have to bring up Trump <laughs> at this point. I mean, mm. he is in administration just right now. I wonder if we analyze the voters' mentality a bit. Do you think it's possible that American voters cherish Trump? Because he's so flawed, because he's Absolutely. vulnerability, and they, you they, know what they, they, they want to come back the psycho, punish him. I, yeah. Not even punish him. No. I think that the point is this. You know what was for me uh, uh, an important point? You remember weeks before the elections when Trump said something vulgar or false or stupid? Uh, liberal media said, oh, now he committed public suicide. Yeah. So, no, it right helped here. him, yeah. yeah right? And we, in psychoanalysis, we know this. This is how you identify with a leader, yeah. through his or her mistakes, stupidities. Yeah. And the liberal media, by attacking Trump mm -hmm. in this brutal way, they were ordinary people, many ordinary people, felt that through Trump, they were attacking them. Yeah. For them, these weaknesses, even vulgar stupidities of Trump, I mean, most of white male people find secretly, they would not admit it, so, so attractive, they, this idea, oh, I can grab women by the yeah, pussies exactly. and so right. on. Yeah. They said, wonderful, you see, he's like one of us and but, so, so on. But in, in a way, they must know he is part of the establishment. So in a way, these voters don't hate establishment, they just won't become one. Or... No, they, uh, here comes this uh, false populist idea. Yeah. Ordinary people distinguish spontaneously this uh, creative capitalists from this corrupted establishment. You know, that's the trick. That's the trick. As if there is some honest capitalist class uh, okay. against the false corrupted establishment and so on and so yeah, on. Yeah. And but but let me return to your previous point about how this is why, and this uh, 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 created so much hatred against me when people ask me, okay, who is now, which is now the predominant form of liberal ideology in the United States? Mm -hmm. And I said that although I admire them. You know these political comedians like John Stewart, yeah, John Oliver. Yeah. I claim, although I mean it's very professionally done, they are mostly right. 
but their ideology. Because it's just an outlet of this brutal arrogance against Trump and through them against the ordinary people. Yeah. You know, it's the worst. It, you know what they avoid? The true problem with Trump is for me that he is basically a symptom. And, and all this criticism of Trump is for me is as in medicine, you know. Yeah. We co call something just uh, symptomal healing, like Lots you, of, you, yeah, 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 it just eases yeah. the pain, yeah, yeah. but it doesn't uh, uh, treat the causes. So and you, and it would be enough to criticize them on the yeah, criticizing and Trump think, is okay, just, yeah. The key point is this one, the failure of the liberal leftist elite. Yeah. They, we all know this, they lost contact with ordinary people yeah, and yeah. so on and so on, and they went into this LGBT political correctness and so on. So I claim, that's why I said something which, of course, I didn't mean it literally. But my hope was that if, if Trump is elected, it will maybe awaken the do left. You, do you think so now? I mean, Yes, but I give it time. Yeah, okay. My God, people told me, you see, you were wrong. Wait a minute, the guys in power, not even one week. I'm not talking, I'm yeah. talking about months, maybe even years. I'm talking, and I think that then we are really lost. My hope is not a new communist party. I'm it, not... Isn't it much easier for powerful people from whatever yeah. side they are to just be part of the power instead of transforming it or try to, you know, have a structural change or such? Yeah, but the problem is not this one. The problem is this one. To awaken yeah. a more authentic left also among ordinary people. And that's why I think Bernie Sanders is so important. He has his limitations. But you know what's the point? Till Bernie Sanders, American left w was mostly this multicultural single issue groups, uh, sexual liberation, LGBT, anti-racism and yeah. so on. But Trump mobilized precisely those who did not feel addressed by American liberal left, ordinary people with their anxieties and so on and so on. And uh, that's the only chance. Because most of the people who voted for in preliminary for Sanders, mm -hmm. are people who otherwise would have voted for Trump for the rightist populism, yeah. and I think that's why Hillary lost, yeah. because many of, Tra of Sanders voters Didn't were vote. so disappointed by yeah. how Hillary yeah. smashed Sanders yeah. that they, if not voting for Trump, they abstained, they stayed at home. Do you think the recent Women's March is a way for ordinary people to express their... Not only, it's not enough. No. It's a very good thing. What I also like is that they didn't just do some abstract statements, yeah. like women's rights, blah, blah. They made concrete demands, health care, and so on, and yeah. so on. So, yes, I'm not... a uh, uh, communist utopian. Yeah. I'm not saying let's wait for the big revolution. No, we have to begin with modest, precise measures. That's why even with uh, Obama, many leftists were stupidly disappointed in him. What did they expect? That Obama will introduce socialism in yeah. Yeah. But for example, remember Obamacare health care. Although it was a compromise, but he did something which was almost unacceptable for American right-wing, at least, establishment opinion. They dragged him to Supreme Court. We need more things like this. Yeah. Women's rights, health care, and yeah. so on and so on, ecology and so Let's on. Let's talk about practical uh, measures and then bring yeah. it back to Europe. On refugees. A lot of people talk about refugees as a male issue because of the disproportion of yes, gender yeah, among yeah. refugees. Mm. And in article you wrote last year on the Cologne attack, you, yeah. you concluded that those young men who assaulted the women that night knows very well what they were doing. And they are doing it no, precisely. I even uh, corrected my statement that yeah. this should be interesting. You know, they were talking so much about what that meant, yeah. but nobody, even I, because I didn't know it, that, uh, took care to look at it from their position. Yeah. What did this mean? And my friends from Egypt, from uh, when I was in Ramallah, yeah. Palestine, told me, but this is their common ritual there, okay. that men gather in the evening on the market, and it's not rape. They almost never fully rape women, but you know, play with women like this in a sexist way. They just stage there mm -hmm. a pretty common lower class collective Ritual. Yeah. It's part of their common life. So, but uh, uh, what I oppose is uh, 
That's why the title of my book on this is Against the Double Blackmail. Yeah. On the one hand, of course, I'm against this racist right-wing uh, 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 European nationalism. But I'm also opposed to this simplistic leftist view yeah. who claim that any problems with refugees are just a result of European racism but and so on. I, 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 I don't know enough about it, yeah. but in principle... In principle, I would agree with it. But yeah. you know what's important for me? That's good about Canada, although I don't idealize Canada. They <laughs> yeah. have other well, so, so The way they treat their own minorities, yeah. in, uh, Native Americans, Indians and Eskimos, it's horrible. Yeah. But satisfaction, so let's try to practically solve it. You see, we should talk about all this openly. Yeah. Also, this is an open problem. I always emphasize it. Uh, that uh, on the one hand... Uh, to integrate them. But you just told me a very beautiful thing about Calais. Yeah. But I don't think they really, many of them, want to be integrated. No, it's much they want, easier and They want to European themselves. welfare, but yeah. their own way of life. Yeah. Which is why uh, uh, it's deeply instructive, if you followed this latest so-called terror attacks, uh, Belgium, Paris. Most of the attackers were not refugees. They were second generation refugees. Their parents were already very nicely integrated there. So you see, we should openly talk and rethink. Yeah. Then there is another problem. It's easy to say we Europeans should not impose our values. Mm -hmm. We should uh, tolerate their way of life. Okay, but for example, with women's rights, when will you draw an, uh, the distinction? If you have a certain community, and you have them. Well, yeah. it's part of their way of life that in marriages, still marriages are decided by yeah. parents yeah. for the girl being aggressive. For example, I know examples from Sweden, from Netherlands, from Germany, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, immigrants began to attack gay parades, pride parades, and so on yeah. and so on. Okay. Here, I think we should establish some rules, you know, it, it, because uh, you cannot say each group its own way of life. Yeah. You have to set a certain limit concerning women's rights, tolerance of other ways, and because we should talk about all of this openly. Yeah, you know, all, all this time when people talk about refugees, a male issue, I wonder what... That's a very they, good point. Where are the women? Exactly, because they are not able to get all the way to Europe. Their mothers, their sisters mm. will not be encouraged to get out of the po extreme poverty to look for, for the way. Uh, that's the yes. other tragedy. Are we aware that when you get refugees, <laughs> usually the most active yeah. group, active also in the sense of creative, business-oriented, yeah, yeah, yeah. escapes? It's the same paradox like I was told in the United States. You know that American Cubans, immigrants from Cuba, mm -hmm are now, on average, more wealthy than Jews. Yeah. But you know why? Because, of course, the those best. more creative escape from yeah. Cuba. Yeah. Okay, exactly. so what will then happen? All the creative people will escape from Syria, yeah. Iraq, and so on. And what, uh, So the second thing, also, we should talk openly about it. Look, this mega shame. We have a group of... When refugees, their first point of escape are usually the poor Arab countries, yeah. relatively poor, Turkey, Egypt, Lebanon, but wait a minute, just below the area of war, we have a couple of mega rich Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, okay, Emirates, yeah. their, their policy is no refugees, although most of the refugees are not Shia, but Sunnis, yeah. so they are their own. So why is this happening and so on? Yeah. I mean, you see what I mean? We should openly talk about all of this, not just this humanitarian mantra, millions want to come to Europe and so on, and why don't we receive them? I think that if we, we should look at it as a geopolitical and economic problem yeah. and solve problems at this level, what I'm most opposed to is some crazy European leftist in, I'm not joking, have this vision. In Europe, we need a revolution. Mm. But European working class is too corrupted, they will not do it. Mm. So with refugees, we uh -huh. will import the true really? proletarian 
as if, you know, it's a crazy idea, like outsourcing the revolutionary agent, no? We want a revolution, you import the working class to do the revolution. Yeah. It's madness. If this policy goes on, uh, the uh, nationalists like Marine Le Pen and yeah. so on will... And so the key problem behind all of this, I think, is... And it's a tragic problem, there is no easy solution. It's clear that the big loser in the last years is standard left liberal establishment. They promised welfare with justice yeah. and so on, gay rights, all that, that's good, but they lost contact with this silent working class majority. Yeah. And then the choice here is clear. Either populism, as uh, you already said, and as people, if you listen to Marine Le Pen or to Trump, sometimes he sounds almost like radicalized Sanders. They are the only ones who openly address, of course, in a mystified way, working class. I think that the tragedy is that only a more radical left, mm -hmm. the left which openly confronts the problem of working class and so on, and at the same time it should be internationalist left. But then, but then don't you can think save that us? the majority of the voters are actually those who are so discontent of the situation that they will no longer be on the top of the magic mountain, they have to get out from their privileges, that's sort of their fear toward the global, globalization. Yeah, but, they, no? the, but the good thing is that nonetheless many of them are gradually losing these privileges. Yeah, exactly. And that's the miracle of Bernie that's, Sanders. That's, that's, he did... Uh, yeah. Bernie Sanders is the proof that also a leftist vision can mobilize this ordinary... How, how would you describe today's Europe's ideology, though? How would you define it? You defined a while ago that there's two realities, one that's wanting to be the... No, I, I think the, the tragic thing is this one. Till now, till 10 years ago, mm -hmm. even a little bit more, European politics had this basic, almost like yin-yang oscillation, yeah. you know? Yeah. You have moderate conservatives, moderate left, and they were uh, uh, replacing each other in power. Something started to happen some 10 years ago. We have a new polarity. The big establishment capitalist party, which is usually, even in cultural matters, left liberal multiculturalist, and this nationalist populist right. And Insofar as we will be caught in this deadlock, I am a radical pessimist. Gra because only the nationalist right is addressing yeah. the working class. Yeah. The this is the craziest thing of Europe now. Look, you know who at this moment is, is, uh, is, is enforcing measures which amount to a big transfer of wealth from the rich to the poor? Poland, the extreme right-wing government, oh. they now, uh, they now uh, 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 accepted the whole set of laws. They lowered retirement, they put uh, higher, uh, they, 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 sorry, lowered the retirement age, they elevated uh, retirement, uh, pension, how much you get, better health care and so on. It's incredible. No, no moderate left government dares to do that. On the other hand, this is the European tragedy. If you go to the south from Poland, Syriza, and this was an ingenious thing how Europe dealt with Greece. Syriza, the hope of the left, is now the most faithful executioner of the most brutal austerity politics. Yeah. If we don't, and uh, you know what's the danger here? The danger is that's why part of British left was also for uh, Brexit. Yeah. The danger is some of the left things, since European Union and international capital are global, the only way is strong nation-state. I radically don't believe in it. I think yeah. this is a path to catastrophe. Yeah. Because today, nation-state cannot survive alone. You are even more exposed, you are even more uh, helpless in the face of global capital. I think the only solution is to global capital is not stronger nation state, but a new leftist international. For example, I believe that if Sanders gets stronger in the United States, if there will be, but maybe it will not be, a stronger European moderate left, then it can be done something, but it can be done at least in all the developed countries more at a global level. Yeah. Otherwise, it's quite possible that we will be, that Europe will become, you know, now it's the moment of truth for Europe. The yeah. biggest loser of 
American elections is Europe, because Trump's message when he said America first was, I can make a deal with Putin, maybe even with China, with Africans, Europe is out. I'm very curious on how that message is passing along to my generation, a younger generation. So you, you said very, uh, quite earlier that people often don't know what they want, or want the wrong thing, or... Uh, don't want to want yeah. yeah, exactly. But the problem I, is that in I, Europe, I, elites also don't know yeah, what but, they but, want. But, you know, as a young person, I find that really familiar. My parents tell me that. My seniors tell me that. You, Lulu, you want wrong thing. But, but, you okay, know, but what? It's they okay. Wrong, okay, but what do they want? Yeah, no, but I feel like it's okay. I want the wrong thing, right? It's not that uh, horrible. But if you tell me that the majority of the population could be flawed and wanting the Absolutely. wrong thing. Absolutely. And what, what does we do as a young generation of voters? Already you see people's opinion. Are I would say like different. this. Quite often you should boycott it. No, don't vote. <laughs> okay. Because I, I think that I'm not absolutely skeptical about democracy, government should be controlled and so on. But we have to accept a sad lesson that people, by people I mean simple numerical majority, are not always right. But if young people don't vote, don't you think when they become a little bit older, when they become mm. needing a little bit more than the... No, 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 it. it's not, uh, you know, there are different ways of not voting. Mm -hmm. There is not voting in the sense I don't care, mm -hmm. But there is, but you can afford this when things still go relatively well. You know, the uh, National Front in uh, France, okay. its majority supporters are people who are young, younger than 25 years old. I expect this, yes. I, this, no, nothing surprises yeah. me. But my point would have been that they, the supporters of National Front, with the good politics they can be, there are more of potential left supporters in national front than yeah, in yeah. liberal sector and yeah, so on. Yeah. And this will be the battle. That I see Europe as next big ideological battle. Europe, I'm still fond of Europe. Europe did some great thing. It invented democracy in this radical sense of the place of the power is empty, nobody has automatic right to be in power. It develops a radical notion of feminism, democracy, human rights and so on. But I think Europe is now in mega crisis. The old liberal model is losing. Mm -hmm. And again, if Europe is confronting a big choice, mm -hmm. either left will become with a new global model, and Europe is almost the only place where this can come, or Europe will become a province of primitive nation states and so on and so on. I want to continue bring up the, the idea of public sphere. And, uh, you know, the word post-truth was selected as the word of 2016 by Oxford uh, mm. Dictionary. It's totally a new thing. You know? We always go to news to look for what we already mm. wanting to hear. But today it seems that people are forming their imaginative communities and their own realities much faster. It is so empowering for people to say like, guess what, you're wrong and you're fake. <laughs> I uh, know, I agree. You know, I, I wonder what's the future of journalism, media, are, are there, will be... Will I know, there here be... I'm an old-fashioned yeah. European metaphysician, the philosopher Emmanuel Kant already emphasized this public sphere, and I... But you know what's the problem here? First, let's just not exaggerate the state before this post-factual era. There also, you know, often... It was also a very post-factual era. Yeah. Like, so let's not claim that before we had an authentic public sphere and now mm -hmm. we are in some... No, because the, that's the tragedy. This So we have to fight here. There is no way back. I think that what we... There is no way back to the old era. My God, listen, the whole Cold War and afterwards. It was also a sphere of life, systematic distortion of life and so on and so on. Just look about all the topic of human rights. On the one hand, it's good that this is some kind of a progress, that now if we detect violation of human rights, even in a foreign country, we are worried. But at the same time, you can see, even in the Western, so-called free media, how selective it is worried. It's always some countries which are, for example, if the concern for human rights would have been serious, so you then you should talk people, all the time about Congo. If Co people are attacking at each other so publicly nowadays, do you think then the, so the, ah, that's the, another problem, the, the which is not just this media, and this is for me the tragedy of uh, Trump. Trump is not alone here. This uh, decay, disintegration of what I call 
common decency, morality, and so on. Under Trump, you can say publicly things, vulgarities, and so on. I worry about this almost more than about post-factual aspects. How the way you are allowed to talk today, yeah. and so on. It was unimaginable 10, 15 years or 20 years yeah. ago. Not only at the level of content, like now it's legal to debate, should we have torture or not, what kind of torture, but more, again, this vulgarity and so on. But my point is that this vulgarization of public space is for me the big defeat of political correctness. Mm -hmm. Because political correctness failed here by trying to control it through this exact regulation, what expressions you can use and so on and I so on. I want to pick up with the political correctness yeah. because I want to ask about violence a bit. Like on, on a quite personal level. So like we ordinary readers will, mm -hmm. uh, on our smartphone will be popping up a breaking news about a violent attack. Mm -hmm. I, Reading it, you know it's complicated, yeah, yeah. it may be legitimized, and yeah, maybe yeah. not, it may be happened here yeah, yeah. and there, there will be more soldiers, etc. And, you know, like, and I would think, look, I know there's more domestic violence than these few people yeah. who died. How, do you, like, what, how does violence work and the compassion and the understanding? This is a very good question, because I think that, that I wrote a book which is even now selling very well, but some people attack it as very problematic about violence, because I think that first we should define what is violence? Where do we see violence? Uh, we should expand our notion of violence. First, in the experience of ordinary people, we do not have only what I call subjective violence, when some people are hurting other people. In capitalist economy, when there is a crisis, mm -hmm. like 2008, when millions lost all their fortune, their jobs, this was for them a terribly violent violent event. So we have this, what I call, objective, anonymous violence, when your whole life is shattered and so on. Then, you know, we always tend to confuse violence with change. That's why what I'm usually asked is, but ha has every, does every change have to be violent? But never forget that there is a lot of violence necessary just to keep things the way they are. Yeah. So we should always widen our view. In this sense, I am not always against violence in this narrow sense of at least violent, not, I don't like violent demonstrations, mm -hmm. but violence is also, for example, a big general strike. This is a form of violence because it breaks all social activity breaks it, brings to a standstill, and so on. My formula was, for which I was so much hated, that uh, the problem with Hitler was that he wasn't violent enough. <laughs> yeah. And then I said, Gandhi was more violent than Hitler. Because I think Hitler's violence was not real. Okay, it was real it was violence. Free, Hitler, but it was a reactive violence. The goal of all his violence was to prevent the disintegration of capitalist order. He wanted to save the system, while Gandhi was, in this sense, more violent. He wanted not to save, but to break the system. Look, if this is a scenario when you have a dinner uh, with your friend, and suddenly there's an attack in Brussels, what, what should the one's immediate response to uh, No, oh, what do you I, think? I tend not to be too horrified, because, no. you know, I liked uh, the reaction of a Syrian refugee, mm -hmm. I quote it, it's well known, when... He was in Brussels, and you know what was his reaction? Yeah. You see, this is our daily reality. Uh, yeah. What is for you here a state of exception and so on, you know. So we should still my, uh, uh, bear in mind what? My friend, although he is a right-winger, the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk, wrote a wonderful book where he said that we in developed capitalism live in a kind of a cupola, protected. Yeah. And yeah. for us, violence is when those outside of cupola Bombas try to, but these are just momentary shocks. And it's but for people outside, this horror is daily reality. Yeah, yeah. Great. Like look at a country like Congo, Republic of Congo, where in the last years four or five million died of unnatural death. Yeah. Where do you find that in our media? Almost nothing about exactly. it. Yeah. I told when I was in Ramallah. I told Palestinians, are you aware that you in the West Bank, occupied by Israel, your state is still 
a paradise compared to Congo. Yeah. You know, it's so, there is so much brutal violence which is neglected. Yeah. So if we seriously want to fight violence, re- let's bring it out. Again, first, this systemic violence. Second, this uh, violence which is part of the way things normally function. Look at a country like Mexico. It's an yeah. extreme case. All okay. right. On the note of violence, yes. <laughs> I uh, uh, after I announced my interview with you, I actually collected a few um, videos from my audience who are curious as well and really okay. wanting to okay. send. Uh, I have one more question, right. but I, I think it's better. How do you yeah, make yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Second. Yeah. Whether the human prediction is an arrangement of God. Third, do you believe that the world can be recognized? Fourth, how do I make what is the meaning of so many people in the world? So first question was how do I make prediction? Yeah. Prediction. Prediction. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't no, get no, the I other. Have, I think I have it here. So, okay. Okay, okay. yeah, just you read the, because... Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll yeah. repeat it. So, yeah. uh, how do we make prediction? When we make prediction, is, an arra- is it an arrangement of from the God? And do you think uh, the world is recognizable? And what's the point of having so many people in the world? Maybe, yeah, <laughs> something quickly. Like, what's the point of having so much people in the world? Like, why well, we well it's, uh, I, here I am a primitive Darwinian, there is no point in it, it's just evolution, but I agree with him yeah. that we should brutally regulate it. I always was for, okay, we can debate, it should be done in a much more human way. And I think we don't know it. We the problem with yeah. predictions is that they can be what people call self-fulfilling oh, prophecies. Mr. Zizek, you know? I feel so lucky to ask a question. Uh-huh. As we know, there is no working class party in the USA. So what do you think the American people can do to find hope after the vote? After the The vote. And uh, do the left need to build a new party? Ah, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, the, po- the problem is a much more, I agree with the question, mm-hmm. it's even more tragic because the only one who, although it's a pseudo working class party, just ask yourself in developed Western countries who still appeals to the working class, like I speak for ordinary people, only the right wingers do it. <laughs> you know, that's the tragedy. Yeah. And uh, I would say this. Uh, the problem is much deeper. After the failure of communist regimes and so on, where, and I don't mean this as a critical point, mm. I always compare here China with Britain, Great Britain, where Marx says that it was the genius of British bourgeoisie, mm-hmm. capitalists, to <coughs> keep aristocracy in power. The problem is, but why is there no working class party? The problem is simply, do we have a vision? What should this working class party stand for? I always ask, again, we are back to Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street, to uh, uh, protesters. I was asking, but what do you want? Do you want just a little bit more honest capitalism? Do you want some Keynesian state capitalism? Do you want more radical uh, nationalizations? Do you want some kind of a self-management local communities want? And the left doesn't have really a feasible alternate model what to offer to the people. I think that here we are really, I always like to quote the Italian, you must know that quote, Marxist Antonio Gramsci. He wrote that famous passage where he says, when the old is dying, Mm -hmm. but the new is not yet born, this is the age of monster, where horrible entities come. We are in that era. Capitalism obviously is approaching a crisis. If you look at our financial crisis, ecology, refugees, and so on. You mentioned Gramsci. I think uh, the next question yeah. is going to uh, probably relate to yeah. that, because he, mas- uh, he, he, he talked about organic intellectuals, right? Next question, actually, criticize intellectuals, but I'll, I'll yeah, play yeah. it in Chinese. I'll the 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 在东西方近现代历史上都层出不穷而且随处可见并且最重要的一点是承受这些思想造成的苦难的都是普通的个人 
。但是如今，齐泽克先生重新提起这些主张，是否是一种精英知识分子的傲慢和无知？谢谢。There. Um, so he ta- he he said that you advocate for disorder because that represents some kind of hope, and he said, "Isn't that?" Uh, Where did he find that? Okay, we would have to go into detail. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Well, it's like a structure, uh, like there's a um, disorder under the heaven. Ah, that was specific and, and, and one. Anyway, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, but then uh, he, he says that has happened in history for multiple times. Whether that that kind of thought is uh, intellect is exactly intellectuals <laughs> being ignorant and arrogant. So well, first, I would say that uh, you know it's not just ordinary people. Intellectuals also <laughs> suffer <laughs> quite a lot. You know, <laughs> yeah. the first great disorder. How you call him? The first emperor. Yeah. He, didn't he call all Confucian philosophers and then he buried them alive? You no, know? yeah. he said the debate is over. It's over. Yeah. Won, no? So no, I would say this. No. no, wait a minute. First, I deeply agree with the underlying thought of yeah. this. Uh, 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 nice person. Oh, yeah. Yes, that. Uh, like I don't like these big enthusiastic moments of you know, we all European intellectuals so fascinated in Greece, Tahrir Square, or in Tahrir Square in Egypt, Syntagma Square. One million people gathered all together. Now, what interests me is, as I call it, the morning after. Yeah. What happens when things return to normal? How do ordinary people feel? Experience the change. Did anything really change? And I think this is the failure of the left. The left always knows to organize big events. You know, this is why maybe your readers will like it or listeners. Was it popular in China among intellectuals, probably not globally, or was it shown there the film V for Vendetta? Yeah. You saw it. Yeah, of course. Okay. You know what's my standard joke?、Mm-hmm. You know how the film ends. Yeah. People win. Okay. Losses, okay.、Yeah. I usually say that I'm ready to sell my mother into slavery. <laughs> okay. She is dead. It's no great thing.、Uh, to see a film called V for Vendetta Part Two.、Mm-hmm. But what happens then the next day?、Yeah. What measures does you know? I hate this enthusiastic moment. What interests me is everyday life. How you.、Uh, yeah. And here, although it failed, I, I, I want to cut you there and bring you back to because our time is coming to the no, end. But we, but, a, no, 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 sorry, just to finish. Yeah, okay.、Uh, what I'm saying is that、uh, no, I am well aware of this cynical attitude、yeah. of disorder and、yeah. so on. But what I nonetheless want to say that disorder doesn't depend on us. I'm not saying I'm not saying this. I know what horror is disorder that we should create a disorder. I'm saying, just don't be afraid. Often there is a chance in disorder. Like, look at today, Trump. Yeah. It's.、Uh, I hope it will remain trauma, almost unimaginable thing happen. Isn't this at the same time a chance? A chance to build a more authentic left, and really only a chance. I'm not saying there is any type of Marxist certainty, or, certainty yeah, whatever. No, yeah, no, just my message is just don't be. Afraid, they are horrible thing, but use disorder as an opportunity. Yeah, great.、Uh, I have one last question,、Please. which uh, uh, I think it fits very well how you describe it. There's a monster time we live in. So yeah, we live、yeah. in this monster time, and we're people who think, who watch movies,、yeah. read news, and we have all、yeah, these、yeah. monologues. We yeah, think yeah. about ourselves. I wonder if we could, as an end note, provide a few provocative questions for us to ask ourselves. In order to sort of like you know get out from the comfort zone, engage with people, or somehow, like, you know what I'm saying,、uh, uh, we are. I will tell you. I will really give you a provocative point,、mm-hmm. which is an interesting one.、Uh, monster times, okay, but some of my optimist friends are、mm-hmm. like the one who wrote that book on genetics, Matt Ridley.、Mm-hmm. He is now a member of what he calls a circle of rational optimists. Okay. And he claims, why do people talk today that we are in a crisis? Even with terrorist attacks, they are relatively minor.、Uh, yeah. In most of the world, even in Africa, things are gradually picking up. Even in United States, it's now better. Far East, it's still 
progressing and yeah, so on. Yeah. Like we have to laugh in Europe when we say, "Oh, crisis in China this year. You have only a growth of six point seven percent. We would kill our parents to get that growth." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they claim uh, never did in the world. So many people live in such relatively good conditions, yeah, mm -hmm. and they claim, for example, we live in the last decades in the first period in entire human history where overweight is more of a problem than, yeah, hunger. than, than hunger and exactly. so on. Yeah. So my provocative question would be, mm -hmm. while all this is true, and for example when I talked about crisis in Korea, before they had these problems <laughs> now with uh, their president or yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. when I said crisis they started to laugh it and they said we are doing well, China is doing well, United States under Obama was doing better, and they told me even in Europe, like Poland, some kind, they, they said, you leftists want to be anti-Eurocentric and universal, but when you talk about crisis, the only continent really in crisis, incredible things are happening. Why do we still experience our time as a time of crisis? Yeah. It's, very, it's something a little bit enigmatic. Why? Although people don't live so bad, why do we have so much rage and so on and so on? No, the first thing to do here is to be precise when there is progress. So this is a very sad lesson that, you know... Yeah, we, you, think of, we should think about... Yeah, why yeah, that, that it's, 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 it's not... As, you cannot simply say things are horrible. Yeah. No, comparatively they are not so horrible. Yeah. Why then do we still... And I think we are not wrong. We do live in extremely dangerous times, especially because of Trump, this Trump's last manifesto, no? You know what's the best definition of Trump, I think? You know, when I was young, ecologists like this motto, maybe you know it also in China, act locally, think globally. Yeah. No, Trump is the opposite. He thinks locally, mm -hmm. America first, but he still wants to act globally. Yeah. He now threatens China because of those islands. Yeah. He threatens uh, 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 Middle everywhere. East or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And uh, what is happening, one of the best definitions of Trump era was that basically his message was very anti-American and sad. His message was, America first means, look, we are no longer the only global superpower. We should be just one among Protect the states ourselves. taking care of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, but these moments are always extremely dangerous, if you ask me. Yeah. Because, you know, in Cold War, there were a certain unwritten rules. How you act. We are searching for these rules today. Mm -hmm. And always things can explode. We are into... searching for problems now, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, but also for unwritten rules. Like, for yeah. example, what are the rules? And here, although I also don't like too much, I don't know what this means, this... Chinese politics now, but on the other hand, I'm not totally opposed to it because, you know, it's a little bit irrational. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, look, uh, if you look at United States military bases, mm -hmm. the whole China is surrounded from yeah. Pakistan to there. Okay. And then imagine China doing this, yeah. putting military bases with Iran. Yeah, yeah. so you, you know, and we desperately need a new world order, mm -hmm. not in this sense what it means today, yeah. but some. I believe in good manners. Like yeah. old, I believe the world needs... Don't you have this wonderful old Chinese word Li or what? Which means this customs, unwritten rules of what? Oh, yeah, 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 Li. Li we need a Li for the world. Yeah, you know? okay. On that note, yeah. <laughs> I think this comes to the end yeah, of yeah. the conversation. And uh, uh, interestingly, you're talking about the Li, which is one of the biggest festival in China is coming up. The Spring Festival. Everyone goes yeah, back yeah. home and uh, gather yeah. with their family. At the very end of our conversation, I wonder if we could uh, congratulate our audience uh, on the on the Chinese New Year using a Chinese word, which is Xin Nian Hao. If you How would, I want xin, to pronounce. Yeah, Xin Nian Hao. Xin Nian Hao. Xin like Xin. Yeah, X I N Xin. Xin. N I N A I N I A N Nian Xin Nian. Xin Nian Hao. Hao. Yeah. Okay. To all my Chinese listeners, Xin Nian Hao. Happy New Year for you, and I like it very much. You do it more intelligently than us. We stupid Europeans do it in the middle of winter. You know, so, Happy New Year, and then, bah, you go out the same sheet, the same cold. Same for you, season. at least, it is, it is getting better. Yeah. Although I must say that my favorite time is winter, 
because I like it cold, but I like it staying inside and just looking out, it's out, it's cold, so inside it's hot and I can do what I like, read books. I must say that my happiest moment in China was my two sons went around in Shanghai yeah. and I was, I was a snob in a nice uh, uh, wealthy hotel, I got a special offer there in French concession oh. and I was this was my moment of happiness. Oh, really? It was a hotel which has some special from Japanese uh, wood bath yeah. close to the window. I was looking at Shanghai uh, sitting in a hot water and watching on my tablet a good movie. <laughs> that was my happiest so, moment. Did you go to Great War though in China? Great? Great War? Yeah, but it didn't particularly impress but you me. Watched the, did you watch the movie Great War, the recent movie from Zhang Yimou? But I, I don't like my. I uh, it again. It emotionally it left me empty. Oh yeah. My uh, my my uh, tales of uh, Johnny Moe are here pretty traditional. I like his early modest films, like that wonderful love story about a girl who takes the young uh, Gong Li, I think, yeah. who takes a train to visit oh, yeah, his course, lover yeah. and all those films. I like those. Then, as an amusement, I love. Not so much the middle one, House of the Flying Daggers, yeah. but Hero, you know I also like Hero, as an old steel, half Maoist, oh. because that film is for the Emperor, no? Yes, yeah. It's yeah. 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 problematic, yeah. you know, for some. Yeah, I know. And but especially, it's, it's kind of a Shakespearean, aristocratic drama, yeah. but it's so beautifully short, Curse of the Yellow Flower, wrote the third one. Yeah. It's breathtaking. I think that if you, China, proceed in that way, you will be the next Hollywood, you Let's know. Let's hope that. Let's go. Yeah, but <laughs> here, I don't know what's the mistake. Something went so wrong, there is not enough emotional tension or whatever. Yeah. You know, I wish him all, but he must be in some kind of a crisis, Jean Kimo, now. Because also, the, another movie he made recently taking place, I don't know, in Shanghai of the 20s, some gangsters and so on. I also didn't like it. Yeah. I think he he lost his way. No? Yeah. But I still think that, again, your creativity, your science fiction novels, your visual art, your science movies... Science fiction novels? Which science fiction novels? Uh, I mean, of course, that, how is he called? The Three-Body Problem. Ah, Liu Xin Si. Liu Xin Si. It was fascinating. Problems. Immediately, I will open my next philosophical book with that, because, you know, it's such a nice opposition, Maoist, yeah. order, disorder. Yeah. Because our Earth has regular rhythm, order, that planet has disorder. Three yeah. suns, you don't know how, and all those problems of communication. It's really an intelligently written novel. And now I'm turning to other, uh, because, you know, I cannot, I have big problems with reading. There are a couple of serious writers that I like like in Europe, Samuel Beckett, Kafka, the Russian Platonov. Yeah. But I like very much detective novels and uh, science fiction, intelligent yeah. science fiction. Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, I saw, you already mentioned this, yeah. I saw that good Chinese detective novel taking place in the North, yeah. some pollution, corruption. I just, I think that for you Chinese that the sign of civilization today is to be a serious culture, you need your own tradition of detective novels. Okay. That's, you know, as Marquis de Sade said in his propagation of universal orgy, Frenchmen, one step more if you want to be Republican. So we have I say Chinese, one step more into detective novels if you want to be a real civilization. Detective novels and the good commercial movies. Good ones. But, <laughs> I'm not, but I'm not kidding here. You know, I have a great respect for good popular commercial films. Yeah. They speak to us, they affect us through them. Like, I always say, if you want to see what is really happening today in America, Look at Hollywood blockbusters. All yeah. the tendencies, the deepest trends, you will you will find them there. You know. <laughs>